Technology enables anyone to connect with people next door and around the globe without ever leaving the office. In what ways does technology affect the trust and influence leaders garner with others? Every leader is supported by an organization of individuals without whom he is obsolete. As such, for the leader, the relationships he forms with subordinates, colleagues, and overseers alike are of utmost importance. Connectedness within an organization breeds trust, unity, and productivity. How then? In an interconnected world where superficial relationships are formed with just a click, does the leader balance building rapport both personally and online? Since technology is unbounded by distance but not time, the good leader must balance his accessibility both on and offline in order to develop authentic relationships. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd now like to turn things over to our morning's panel moderator, Colonel Athens, who will introduce our panel the referent leader, building relationships in the age of technology. Sir. Thanks, Chris. Well, good morning, everyone. We uh, have panel number two here, which is going to focus on, as you saw in the video, how leaders build trust, how they inspire the people who work for them in this age of technology, and how they can balance, as John Nesbitt wrote in 1982 in the book Megatrends, how do you balance this idea of high touch with people and high tech. And I was thinking just the other day about Coleman Lanterns, the Coleman company that manufactures different camping equipment. And they have an advertising campaign right now. And in that advertising campaign, they have a campfire with people around it. And across the top of the advertisement, it says that this is the original social networking site. So the question is, is whether we need more campfires or whether we need more relational websites, apps, and other technology to help us to lead. So to help us answer that, we've got a very distinguished panel. I'm going to just mention each of them and then I'll introduce them in more detail. Mr. Don Fall, who's the head of operations for Pinterest. And then next to him is Mr. Thomas Furlong, vice president for infrastructure at Facebook. Then Dr. Jeffrey McClellan, the Assistant Professor of, Manager of Management at Frostburg State University. Mr. Kim McNeely, Vice President of Marketing and User Experience for Global Analytics. And finally, Rear Admiral John Kirby, the Pen Pentagon Press Secretary. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce each of these panelists in turn. They'll have a couple of brief opening remarks. Then we're gonna open it up to this fine audience to challenge them to dig into this, to this subject, and then I'll close us up with some final remarks. So let me start with our first panelist, Mr. Don Fall. He graduated from the Naval Academy in 1998 and was commissioned in the United <coughs> States Marine Corps. He served as a platoon commander with 1st Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion and 1st Force Reconnaissance Company. After leaving active duty, Mr. Fall attained his MBA from Stanford Graduate School of Business and worked for Google and Facebook, where he held executive positions. He's currently the head of operations for Pinterest, described on their own website as a place to save and discover ideas for your projects and interests. And he leads the community support and outreach, international growth and business partnership and sales. Mr. Fall is on the board of Nuru International, a nonprofit organization focused on battling extreme poverty around the world, and the Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation, an organization that provides college scholarships for the children of Marines. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Fall. Well, uh Thanks so much for the, the kind and generous uh, introduction. Uh, I just wanted to say thanks to START for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's a pretty special experience to come back many years later after graduation in, in a very different capacity. This is a very, very special place. And so the opportunity to come back here and, and share some thoughts on leadership is an opportunity that I, I uh, really cherish. Um, I thought maybe I could um, spend a couple minutes talking a little bit about uh, my experience, having left the academy, a little bit about my time on active duty, and then really primarily talking about how we run our business at Pinterest and the role that technology plays. And I think that's probably a particularly interesting perspective given the fact that uh, we work at really the hub of 
a lot of the technologies that are changing the way that people communicate um, broadly. Um, and, and I'm sure Tom will speak about that as well. Um, so I graduated from here in, in 1998, and uh, if you can believe it, uh, email was just uh, really starting to pick up momentum at that point. Um, uh, we had our desktop computers. Uh, email was really primarily a social thing. It wasn't really a part of, of how, uh, our normal day-to-day, -day, how we operated. And that was true when I got to the fleet as well. Um, I think we had email accounts, but we, were, we didn't really use them in a professional capacity. Uh, unfortunately, PowerPoint was on the scene at that point, and so uh, uh, all of our mission planning um, was, was done on PowerPoints. I can remember when we were planning in, in 2001 uh, for the invasion of Afghanistan. I happened to be on deployment on 9-11. We had an 1,100-slide PowerPoint deck to plan the invasion, true story. It, uh, it took three and a half hours to actually load the deck once we hit present slides. So that, that tells you something about the state of the technology back then. Um, but technology has fundamentally changed the way that people communicate. Um, and I think what is particularly interesting is the rate of change when you look at this industry and when you look at the state of technology, uh, it continues to accelerate. Snapchat didn't exist three, four years ago. You never heard of it. Now it is the most popular social networking platform for teens. Three, four years from now, um, for those of you who are going into active duty, your young Marines, sailors, airmen, will be using a technology that probably doesn't exist today. Uh, and what it means to you as a leader to communicate uh, and, and to understand how people are connecting and how you can connect with your sailors, marines, and soldiers is gonna fundamentally change as well. So I think as leaders in today's day and age, we have to be technologists. We have to understand that landscape, what it means to people um, as we think about how we engage and inspire uh, our, our people. Uh, at Pinterest, I, I thought I'd share just a couple minutes on, on how I engage, how we engage as leaders with our team. Um, I, uh, I manage a team that we call operations. We have a global footprint. So I have, I have folks, most of whom are in San Francisco, but we have people now in Chicago, New York, London, Berlin, Tokyo, Sao Paulo. We're a global team. Uh, and so for the teams who are outside of San Francisco, most of our engagement and communication happens on some sort of digital platform whether it's email or, or video conference. Uh, and those tools have made it uh, really, really easy for us to communicate in a way that wasn't possible 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and that gives us the opportunity to connect and build relationships in a way that wasn't possible uh, and to really facilitate and accelerate decision making. Um, we do a few things to kind of operate the company and, and, and I'll, I'll run through this really quickly and, and happy to speak to it a little bit later. Um, the first thing that I do is, uh, and the way that I engage with my team, is, is we get our entire organization together in person uh, every other month. And this is an opportunity for us to talk about our vision and our strategy. Um, love the fact that you, you got a chance to hear about vision statement yesterday. Uh, I'm a huge believer it's mission critical. Um, you'll talk about, as you get to the fleet, the notion of commander's intent. This, this opportunity bringing my team together every two months is to rehash our comm commander's intent. Why do we exist? What is success for us? What progress are we making together? And I do that meeting in person. Uh, we facilitate it with video conferencing. It, it, it's the best uh, opportunity to bring people who don't have the opportunity to be there in a room together to feel like they're really part of that experience. But for people in San Francisco, we're there face to face. And it gives me an opportunity to get to know them, to hear from them, and give them an opportunity to hear what's on my mind. Uh, in, in running the business, um, I get together my leaders every week and we go through our battle rhythm, so to speak. We look at the kind of core metrics and the core data that, that we use to judge how we're doing as a business. So how are we executing on this path to realizing our vision? Um, we use a variety of different tools. We use email. We use effectively Google's version of PowerPoint to prepare all the materials ahead of time. And that gives us the opportunity to really digest and, and uh, work through that information before we get together in person. And the time that we spend in person is a chance for me to get to understand how my leaders are thinking about their particular part of the business. What are the challenges they're facing? How are they thinking about um, the opportunities in front of them? And where can I be most helpful as a leader in helping them be more successful? I spend an hour each week with each of my direct reports. Um, we call them one-on-ones. They're a chance to sit down in person. Um, I have four direct reports now. They're all pretty seasoned, experienced leaders. And the explicit purpose of that time is for me to understand how I can help them be successful, how I can help them grow. It's about coaching and mentoring. It's a series of open-ended questions um, that gives me a better understanding of what's on their minds, um, where are things going well, 
what are the challenges they're facing and how can I help them as a leader be more effective in their role? Uh, and uh, I, I insist on doing those in person. Some folks will try to do that stuff via email, but I think that time that you spend in person uh, is indispensable. It helps build trust. There's a notion of communicating in person that, that I think can't be replicated on email and other platforms. Uh, and so we think that's really, really important. Finally, I, I, I spend some time doing what I'll call office hours or just ad hoc check-ins. And I do this with members of my entire organization. What I've found as a leader is as you, know, as you grow and your organization grows, it gets harder and harder to understand what's going on on your team, how the, the individual members of your team are doing. I had many experiences of this. I can remember when I got back from Afghanistan, uh, my, uh, actually from Iraq, my second tour, um, I was talking to one of the Marines in my platoon, and I had 30 Marines in my platoon, and uh, I was talking to him after having come back from overseas. He had worked for one of my squad leaders, and he worked for a squad leader who was, had been identified as really the highest caliber, the highest performing squad leader in our entire organization. He was a rock star. And I was talking to this particular Marine on our way to the chow hall one day, and I was asking him how things were going, and he shared with me after much conversation that um, his squad leader, this perceived star, had been a disaster overseas. None of his Marines trusted him. He made callous and, and reckless decisions in combat uh, that put his Marines' at, lives at risk. And this floored me. I had absolutely no idea. Um, for me, this was the strongest leader in my company. Um, and it's a piece of information I never would have found had I not spent that time in person talking to that individual Marine. And so as I think about the role that technology plays, you know, I think about uh, these tools as a, as a complement to the time that you spend in person. I think that time you spend in person, in front of your people, sitting down with your people, um, is indispensable. And, and I suspect no matter how technology evolves, it will never replace that time that you spend face-to-face -face getting to near your people, building trust, understanding what's on their minds. But technology can be a really powerful tool to complement that. It can accelerate decision making, and it can help share information, and it can help um, bring uh, people together in a globally distributed fashion um, uh, to really feel like they're uh, part of and connected to what you're working on. Thanks. Thank you, Don. I think that's one vote for the campfire. <laughs> I think technology got a little bit there, but... Uh, yes, that's a much shorter <laughs> way of saying what I just said for 20 minutes. Thank you. No, I, that, was, that, that was awesome. Um, our, next, our next panel member is Mr. Thomas Furlong. Mr. Furlong is a 1986 graduate of the Naval Academy, served as a surface warfare officer, completing multiple deployments to the Persian Gulf region. After leaving active duty, Mr. Furlong gained ex expertise in the development, design, construction, and operations of mission-critical infrastructure. He has worked for or with Yahoo, Savis Communications, Bechtel Corporation, Sprint PCS, Coopers and Libran, and Ernst and Young. He's currently the Vice President of Infrastructure for Facebook, that tiny enterprise that gives people the power to share and make the world more open and connected. As the Vice President of Infrastructure, he has responsibility for the creation and execution of Facebook's strategy to source mission-critical assets which support the company's customer-facing website, so I guess if Facebook's not working, now we know who to at least look for. And the installation, <laughs> maintenance, and operations of the company's computing infrastructure. Obviously an amazing job that, uh, that he holds. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Furlong. Good morning. Good morning. Let me figure out how far to there be. You um, thank you all for inviting me. Excuse me. <clears throat> I think, I think Don uh, actually gave a great intro, so I'll, I'll piggyback on some of that. Um, my first computer at the Naval Academy was a Macintosh 512, uh, and that was second class year. First time that, and, and I had to go buy it myself. School gives it to you these days, I think. Um, uh, thank you. You know, it's, it's really interesting to think about leadership, uh, to come back and talk about it, because uh, it makes you reflect a little bit on what uh, were some of the I guess, seminal moments that, uh, that push you in a certain direction and how you choose to lead. Uh, at Facebook, I have a globally distributed organization. I have about 500 uh, employees and contractors uh, that are in four states in the United States, a uh, country in Europe, and then I've got a whole bunch of smaller uh, locations in Europe and Asia that uh, are all part of the, the data center uh, infrastructure. Um, 
you know, keeping in touch with that group is probably what I spend the vast majority of my time actually doing. So, you know, being invited to talk about it is, um, you know, this is right in line with what I kind of do every single day. Um, I actually have a group in Virginia, and after I get done here, I'm going to go out there and uh, I'll meet with them and, and uh, yeah, have an all-hands, uh, talk to a lot of the leaders there, uh, have a dinner, um, walk through the site, kick the tires, so to speak. Uh, so it's a, it's a very uh, interesting and, uh, topic for me personally on this balance between uh, what you do in person and what you do via all of the technology that we have at our uh, fingertips today. Um, I'll tell a quick story. So uh, I was main propulsion assistant on a guided missile cruiser, the USS England. Uh, and I have to say, you know, one of the, one of the greatest, most challenging jobs I ever had. But in, on a 27-year-old fossil steamship, um, it's not the easiest thing in the world to maintain and operate. Uh, I had about 80 uh, machinist mates and boiler techs uh, who were working for me, uh, some chiefs and a couple of officers. Uh, and in those days, the ships didn't have a lot of extra room on board for places like an office where you actually could get together and collaborate with your peers or with your leadership team. And what you, what you ended up doing was basically doing work out of your stateroom. Uh, and uh, I would find often I would get a call, you know, something was amiss, there's something broken, I needed to kind of respond to it. Uh, so if I wasn't on watch, uh, I was kind of disconnected from what was going on in the spaces. And it uh, taught me a very valuable lesson, which was the only way I could kind of stay ahead of it was to actually walk around our main engineering spaces uh, and keep abreast of what was going on myself. Um, it kept me ahead of our chief engineer. He was a very challenging uh, leader, uh, if I can use that term uh, loosely. Uh, he, uh, you know, some might say he was a screamer. And so by walking through the spaces, uh, I, I got very familiar with the sailors. Uh, I got to learn what was going on. I learned a lot about the plant. Uh, but I learned a lot about them around what their issues were. Uh, and I probably, as a junior officer, knew more about what was going on uh, than in some ways my chiefs did. Uh, the engineer would come into the space and, and uh, oftentimes berate the chiefs for something and they would disappear. And when I walk in, you know, I'd say, where'd, where'd the chief go? And they said, well, sir, the engineer was down here and that was kind of all I needed to hear. Uh, and I usually found them in the chief's mess and I spent a lot of time with my chiefs in the chief's mess. I was the only officer on the ship other than the captain who was allowed to have a coffee mug in the chief's mess because I spent so much time there. Uh, I got to know them very well. I worked out a lot of the issues that we had. Uh, you know, I think in spite of the engineer, we uh, built a really great team. Uh, the ship was very, very successful too. Deployments to the Middle East uh, went well for us. And, uh, and so I'd like to say that, you know, as one of the kind of founding premise of my leadership trait, I think that personal connection is something that is irreplaceable. That said, uh, we have amazing technology ava available today. Um, you know, I would say uh, Facebook, you know, we use the product. Uh, we have an amazing number of groups that uh, basically allow us to disseminate information on projects and uh, status reports. Uh, it allows us to engage in communication around different topics. Uh, we can also do, you know, post articles and other things to it. Uh, the interesting thing about Facebook is it's very much a give and take. You can you can get people to participate and comment, which is actually the value of, of it. Just a single one-way is not actually as useful as having a two-way communication. We do a lot of video conferencing, uh, and, and I agree with Don, like video conferencing is really great for, for keeping touch and for being able to connect. Um, I, I'll say a personal experience, I, I had a skiing injury and I had a major knee surgery, and I was laid up at home for almost two months. And, uh, you know, what I found with video conferencing was big meetings, don't bother. If you're the guy on the phone or on the video and there's a room of 20 people um, and you want to actively participate, you know, that's not the forum for you. Uh, you know, do something else. And, and I reoriented significantly the way I was working at the time uh, in order to do more one-on-ones, connect with my field teams. Uh, and so, you know, I would say you have to be careful about how some of these technologies uh, help or hurt. They're good in certain cir circumstances. Uh, email is great, but email also doesn't uh, give you uh, emotion or uh, a lot of context behind, uh, you know, in Facebook we pride ourselves on open uh, and candid communication, and in email sometimes that can come across as harsh or mean. 
and be off-putting to the person on the other end. So you have to be careful. Uh, and we do use chat a lot, uh, but we use chat also as a means of uh, grouping a, a people together kind of live to, to do something like debug the site. If there's some issue going on with the site, uh, you know, two dozen engineers will hop on uh, a chat room and start to try to figure out what it is that's wrong. So, you know, I would say probably my philosophy is you've got to balance all of that. Um, I do about 40% of my time as travel, so I spend a lot of time out in the, my field teams. Uh, and as Facebook continues to grow, clearly that, you know, saps a lot of my time. I encourage my leadership team to do the same. Uh, so we try to make up for it with uh, a lot of the, the electronic aids that we have. And quite frankly, that's the only way we're going to continue to, to scale as well. Um, lastly, I want to uh, just talk briefly about what uh, we talk about. And I think um, it's as important or more important. Uh, Facebook is very good at executing, and it does that because it does it in very small teams. It, it uh, encourages small teams to, to uh, go out and take the initiative and to accomplish their tasks. What you do end up with is you do end up with the inevitable clash with other teams. Uh, you end up with some issues around prioritization of resources. Uh, and my philosophy as a leader is I'm supposed to be there to help them through that. I can find resources, I can help with prioritization, uh, but I don't want to be directive and I don't want to tell people what to do. And it's very easy, especially, I've been at Facebook seven years, it's very easy to be a senior person in a room and stifle the type of uh, communication and free exchange of ideas that you want. And I, I find I spend a lot more time today um, coaching, guiding, trying to set context, help people understand about you know, important issues like risk, flexibility, and, and other issues that, that are driving our operation. Uh, so I would encourage you to th not just think about the how, but, but the what are you communicating. Uh, being top down and directive, I don't think is, is the best way to have a, a vibrant, growing, and scaling organization. You have to build that next generation of leadership. So with that, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great remarks. Our next panelist is uh, Dr. Jeffrey McClellan. Dr. McClellan is an assistant professor of management at Frostburg State University here in Maryland. He teaches leadership and management with research interests in servant leadership development, organizational leadership and change, and leadership in Latin America. Dr. McClellan is an experienced consultant, teacher, trainer, and speaker. He earned his PhD from Gonzaga University in leadership studies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. McClellan. Thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Unlike my colleagues, I don't have much history with the Naval Academy. Uh, it goes back about ooh, 10 hours, 20 hours now. Um, but it's been a great experience uh, just seeing this environment and learning a little bit about it. Uh, gives me a better understanding of, of both the capacity that the Naval Academy has to develop leaders as well as to develop great followers. And I, I don't want to underestimate the significance and importance of that. Being the only academic on the panel, I think I'm going to come across as extremely academic. But I figure, hey, why not? I'll take the opportunity. I've been told from my background in administration and as a faculty member that I'm too much of a, an academic to be a good administrator, too much of an administrator to be a good academic. Um, so today we'll, we'll do the academic. When it comes to leadership and uh, this ocean of relationship building and technology, some key things stand out to me. First of all, beginning with what is leadership. Leadership is a social influence process that is directed towards a goal. We might use the word power, we might use the word influence, um, but it's goal-directed influence. And it's grounded in a relationship between a leader and a follower. Uh, and the leader and the follower are mutually influencing one another in order to accomplish the goals. Um, that influence is based on characteristics, processes, skills, relationships that exist in between them and the way that they perceive one another. And all this takes place within a context, uh, and that context is important as well because within that context is, is the cultural uh, embedding that allows for that influence to take place. And if we lose sight of that cultural context, that, that has implications also. When we talk about the relationship, what we're looking at is a relationship and the capacity to form trust. Trust that exists between the individuals. And, and that's significant because when we think about trust, we have to think about not only 
the trustworthiness of the leader and the trustworthiness of the follower, but the propensity to trust that each has. So it's not just, am I trustworthy? Do I have those characteristics and capacities that make me trustworthy as a leader or as a follower? But how willing am I to trust others? And that's important, but it's also a significant challenge because especially when we begin to cross cultural boundaries. And the reason that's significant is because trustworthiness is not something that is within me as leader, but it's based in the perception of the follower. It's whether or not they perceive me as trustworthy. And that is based on their own cultural background, their experience, their personality, and, and so their, their propensity to trust me is as important as my own trustworthy nature. And what is considered trustworthy in one environment may not be in another. Let me give you a specific example. So I, I remember a particular day where I had two emails that I, I was responding to. They'd come back to back. The first one came from a, a colleague in Latin America, and it begins with a thing like, uh, Querido Jeff, uh, which is a very, very, it's a very informal way of saying dear Jeff, um, almost more like beloved Jeff, and it, offends, it ends with, a, uh, with an affectionate hug, and then the name of the individual. And very, very, very um, friendly, very, very laden with emotion, this particular email. And then I, I switch to the next email, and, and it's from a German colleague. And there are no affectionate hugs at the end of that email. <laughs> It, it, there's more of a very blunt, okay, Jeff, I'd have been asking about whether or not I could do a certain thing, and the answer is basically, no, you can't, um, and very, very straightforward. Uh, and both of those emails, I was thinking about if those two emails had gone to each other, the impact that they would have from two very culturally different environments. Um, coming to me, I know both individuals, um, I've interacted with both individuals, and so there's a level of affection that I can feel through those emails because of that face-to-face -face interaction, because of that propensity to trust that I have, um, and because of the trustworthiness they've demonstrated. But we run into some challenges there, because trustworthiness is based on, on some components, uh, our perception of competence in the other our perception of their benevolence, their willingness to put our interests at least at the same level as their own, um, our perception of their character, their willingness to follow through on what they commit to. And all of these things are culturally contingent. And so while technology gives us a tremendous capacity to access others, I can, I can send emails all over the world. Right now I'm trying to establish a, a, a connection with a professor at a university in Brazil, and I'm finding it very difficult um, because a, an email just popping out of nowhere isn't doing much. Latin America, trust tends to be developed when you connect through trusted others. If I can find a key connection and then use that connection to influence then, and, and make it an additional connection, it's a lot easier. But I'm finding that very challenging because that propensity to trust isn't high when you don't have that connection through which you're making those interactions. So again, the technology gives us tremendous access, and that access allows us to begin the process of trust formation, relationship building that allows us to, to become and engage in leader-follower interaction. But the technology doesn't in and of itself give us the capacity to build relationships. And I think that's where we, we can tend to struggle. Uh, and I think that's kind of the key remarks I wanted to leave with you. So thank you for that opportunity. Look forward to your questions. Well, that, that, was, that wasn't too academic. That was, that was good. We, we like that. Our, our next panelist is Mr. Kim McNeely. Mr. McNeely is a 1991 graduate of the Naval Academy, also earned his uh, master's in public affairs from the University of Minnesota and an MBA from Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management. Upon graduation, Mr. McNeely served as a nuclear submarine officer. In the corporate sector, he has been a marketing and brand manager at General Mills, focused on bringing new products to market within the YoPlay, Betty Crocker, Pillsbury, and Nature Valley brands. 
and before his current work served as a director at Intuit, leading the marketing strategy team for TurboTax, which every April I'm very grateful for personally, and creating the innovative new initiatives team within Intuit's consumer group. Mr. McNeely is presently the Vice President of Marketing and User Experience for Global Analytics, a company that uses the power of analytics to fundamentally change the way people do business with the underbanked. I think a term I will let you define for us. Additionally, Mr. McNeely is an executive coach focused on enabling innovation, marketing strategy, and leadership development. Please join me in welcoming Mr. McNeely. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Ooh, you can hear me okay. That's good. Um, hey, uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much again. As, a, as you said, as, as, a, um, as an alum coming back to the yard is fantastic, and it's truly an honor to be here. Um, when we talk about this interconnectedness, uh, leading um, in an interconnected world, it's, it's a privilege to share some perspectives, some frameworks, but it, really at the end of the day, the key is you. You're going to lead um, where we're going to go next because technology is going to change over and over and it's going to evolve and what we're using today we're clearly not going to use again um they'll be, it'll be reinvented our uh, our latest and greatest will be dinosaurs just like those first computers we got when we were here um, but the whole opportunity here is for us to actually build that trust that engender that mutual respect that we had that, that we were able to talk through with the reverent leadership i'm going to take a little bit of a different slant though uh as my bio shows as well so the um I'm a marketer um, after eight wonderful years as a nuclear submarine officer, hence a very glowing personality. Um, <laughs> and as a marketer, you know, my whole focus was and is, how do I interact with consumers to create relationships that's beneficial to both parties? So again, interact with consumers to create relationships that's beneficial to both, par both parties. There's a lot of longer uh, descriptions of marketing, but I find I need simple things, so that works for me. But with that, those, those are, when we're creating relationships, not transactions, sure, I love transactions, but I have to pay for those. I want to build long-lasting relationships. I want to build champions of whatever we're making our brands are, um, so that people advocate for what we're doing. People advocate for Facebook. People advocate for Google. People, kids really like gushers. So, so how do we do that? So you're all actually closet marketers. Let me help you, you know, embrace that and come out of the closet. Um, so you're marketers because we're going to make a little bit of a switch here. So you're creating relationships with your teams, with the people you're working with internally. You're not, this isn't about transactions. Obviously, you have to get the mission, but it's the relationship that enables the, the, each of those missions over the long haul. You're, it's, again, not consumers, your team. You're building those relationships, and it's mutual beneficial for both parties. It's beneficial for you, it's beneficial for your team and the organization because accomplish the mission. Develop and grow professionally. Build a team that is superb in every way. And my goal is to share a few frameworks of how to leverage technology as not just to en enhance the transactions to get the work done, but as an excuse to actually build those relationships and engender that trust. So quick story, absolutely nothing to do with high tech. So, I'm in Minnesota, 60-year-old house, has to be retiled, a portion of it. Never done it before. Thank gosh my father-in-law, Tom, has. So I bring him in, and he volunteers to mentor me. And the mentorship is great, because that prevents a lot of time, and quite frankly, a lot of swearing. So, um, and of course, I could YouTube it, but still, I'm gonna find some issues, and have him over my shoulder, letting me learn all of his mistakes. It's a good bonding experience. First thing we started off was, hey, Kim, do you have the tool? And I'm like, oh, yeah, totally. I go back, go to the garage, pull out this beautiful red toolbox because it's really all I've had to use. So I've got plenty of hammers. I've got some screwdrivers, some pliers. And he literally says, the hammer's not going to cut it, the tile, pun intended. So I'm like, okay, so I've got to find the right tool. So again, another bonding moment because you get to go to Home Depot and search for hours for just the right tool. There's some really high-end ones. There's some low ones. We find the right wet saw. We're good to go. Again, didn't need the high end, it's like Goldilocks. Okay, find the right one, a little, you know, too hot, too warm, too big, too small, just right. So we've got the mentorship, we've got the right tool. Then we've got to declare some boundaries. Tom's a talker, lots of talking going on. And I'm like, hey, I gotta get this done today because my honeydew list has something else for me to do tomorrow. 
So, um, so I, I say, Tom, look, let's get through this. We can have a beer afterwards, as long as we get it done in time and we don't screw it up too badly. So, and he's like, cool with it. We've declared the boundary. He's like, I get it, minimize the chit chat. So we get to work. We get through it and we're like, okay, good. Now we're actually time to celebrate the last piece because any home improvement job that's actually almost successful deserves a beer. So you've got to celebrate. Um, and of course, you've got to celebrate an oops that you always have because inevitably something goes wrong that you either try to cover up or you have to redo. I did, so he looked away for a few minutes. I made a mistake. I got to redo it again, but I learned from it um, overall. And it was actually good to learn and be open about, hey, I made a mistake and I learned from it. So those frameworks of active mentorship, finding the right tool, declaring boundaries, and actually celebrating both the good and the bad actually has sh shown up for me in so many times in my professional environment in a more interconnected, higher tech world. And I'll share those real fast. So on finding the, the right, uh, actually on the mentorship piece. So at Intuit, we have a diversity network and actually all the students here fit into that diversity network. It's called the Next Generation Network. And what's great is, is it's a, it's a different perspective, it's a different culture, and how do we actually leverage that and strengthen it? So we've developed a mentorship program with our senior leadership. And like any traditional leadership uh, mentorship program, these senior leaders are gonna be helping these next generation. We're like, no, we're gonna flip it on its head. We're gonna actually have the next generation who are much, uh, much more savvy on all the high tech. They, they know what Snapchat is. Snapchat is, they actually know what's next after that and they mentored senior leaders. So I'm actually going to, I go in and I'm waiting to talk to our general manager who's talking with um, John, who's a college intern, um, an undergraduate. And I, I, I hear him and John, the college intern, is tasking the general manager with next steps on how to, um, A, change his, I hate to admit it, but he was new, so we fixed it, his feature flip phone, right? It's a few years ago though, right? Um, to his iPhone, and then how to actually step-by-step task each week that he's gonna, they're gonna connect together and they're, they're gonna um, basically make him proficient in the use of the iPhone. So the college intern is training someone well over 50 in uh, how, uh, how to use technology on an ongoing basis. Of course, John got some mentorship from the senior leader as well. And they actually got to connect, they would never actually work together otherwise directly in that way. Talk about great trust, openness, frankness. That actually was a testament to the rest of the organization that says, hey, we're, everybody's got an open door, you can always talk. So that excuse of technology helped engender trust. And oh, by the way, we got more technically proficient. Second piece was in my current role, startup, no big infrastructure, Cisco's just too expensive for us right now. So we've gotta come up with new ways to communicate, we've gotta come up with ways to um, uh, do project management, pretty much everything. We have no set infrastructure overall. So I've unleashed my team to go find out everything they can find out to, to accomplish their job. So we align on what they're solving for. They go out and find what's the latest off-the-shelf, cloud-based platform, whatever it may be, um, and how do we use it. And we experiment, and we fail, and we learn, and we evolve, and we change quite frequently. But for project management, we've done everything with Pro Workflow, SharePoint, Basecamp, Asana, Smartsheet, um, you name it. We continue to evolve, and what we're using today we're gonna change probably in a few months. Um, for communication, you know, we started with Skype because oh, Skype's great. It is. There are about 50 people on there. It really sucks. So you've got to shift. So we went to, you know, we've leveraged other programs. Join me, go to meeting. But what's great about it is we, we do it together as a team. And our team is San Diego, scattered throughout the US, London, scattered throughout England, in India, both the southern and northern parts of India. So we've got folks that are 24 seven that are working together to figure out which technologies help us transact, but it's actually an excuse to have those dialogues overall, which is actually the real key benefit of engendering the trust. The third was on setting boundaries. So I had the opportunity to work with uh, the Boston Consulting Group, sharp people. They work 24 seven, teams all over the place. I wonder how in the world do they do this? Because they're always on, they're online, they're sending emails all the time, they're on conference calls all the time. So I asked them um, um, a little bit more about it, tried to probe, and I found out they have this one weekly meeting that they're passionate about that I'm not allowed to attend, which kind of irked me. Um, but, but as I, they learned to talk about it, this is their declaring boundaries meeting. So every week, no matter where the team is, virtually or face-to-face, -face, they get together for an hour, hour and a half, and they declared their boundaries explicitly. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Victoria is a mom, she's a consultant, so she's traveling all the time. She declares that 
you know, I will, I will work like a dog as needed because it will not accomplish the mission. However, 8 to 9 p.m. East Coast time, so wherever I am at that time, I, I'm not going to work because that's my virtual tuck-in time with my two kids. And we're like, okay, everybody gets that. And they're like supportive of it. But she's explicitly said it so we can support her versus like, where is she? The second one is John. John's kind of an intense guy. Um, workouts are good for him because it calms him down a little bit. When he misses a workout, it's really not a fun experience. So he's like, hey, I'll work any hours you want, but two hours, I don't care when, I need two hours off to work out. Otherwise, you just won't like me. We are all, everyone was all supportive of John getting his two hours of workout. Nobody ever complained. Um, and then finally, Victoria was a senior partner. She, she's nocturnal, I think part vampire. I mean, she sends notes all night long. And she was explicit to say, because everybody's like, whoa, I, I'm on call 24 hours. I'm getting texts at two, you know, emails at two in the morning, and I, I feel that I have to respond. And she's like, she's like, no, she explicitly told the team, I'm going to send my emails out. I'm going to send my messages out. I won't text in the middle of the night, but I'll send all my emails out. But she says, I don't expect you to return those until the next morning, and they set an agreeable time. So she gets, she's able to get her work out, her work out to the team, her communication. The team is able to respond appropriately the next day without feeling guilty in any manner. The reason I say that is they were actually having that open dialogue, whether they were face-to-face -face or around the world, they took just a small portion of time each week and they explicitly said what they need so they can be successful. As the Commandant said earlier this morning, you've got to take care of yourself morally, mentally, physically. Well, even in the, in the business world or in the military, you do need to take that time. And if it's going to interfere because it's a 24-7 world, we've actually found out that just declare it. Sometimes there's going to be a rub, but because you have this open environment that you've nurtured, you, you figure it out. You make a compromise when you need to. But you really try to make sure Victoria can you know, have that tuck in time, and John, by gosh, he's going to get that workout. So that's on declaring boundaries. And the last one is on celebration. So gosh, um, I'm sure the group here and all of you, hard chargers, like let's get it done. Mission you know, accomplished, next. Let's go after it. But there's something to be said for taking just a short respite, and it short can be like almost instantaneous, of just celebrating. And why? To acknowledge the work that was done by the team um, overall. And what was interesting with that is, so Tom, Tom, it's a beer after, uh, you know, a home improvement. Um, uh, we have a celebration at, at Intuit um, tax time. Uh, it's not there anymore, but still an investor. Please use it. Um, uh, you know, a tasteless promotion, I'm sure. Um, so uh, uh, we, have to, we have 15 weeks to make all of our revenue for the year. Talk about a battle plan. Um, you've got to be ready at the beginning. It's going to change. You've got 15 weeks. We test every week for those 15 weeks, running multiple tests. You'll come, on, you'll, come, you'll come on the page, and you'll see something different than someone else will, most likely, in some form or fashion. Um, but we're going so fast that we actually can't take long respites, you know, to say, oh, yeah, good job, you know, pat on the back. So we actually have a gong in the web development room that every time a test launch, this big gong, like gong show, but in a good way, right, um, of the test is launched. And everyone in the building knows that a test is launched, whether you're there or on the other side of the building, which is great because we know, oh, wow, we did it again. Um, so it's a minor thing, but then we also give out this thing that's, I think, even more coveted, which is a skunk award every week. And what a skunk award is, is we're gonna fail. If we're not pushing the envelope enough, then something's wrong. If we push it, you're gonna fail at something. So every week we pick one thing, and people have to submit things, go figure, of how they've messed up. What have we failed at? What test failed? What process failed? What, you know, do we not execute flawlessly? What insight that we, were we wrong about with consumers? And with all of the input that we have, it fosters it, because it's, it's not a bad thing. We give a skunk award, and we, we mean it, in, uh, genuinely, in earnest, it's great. People actually, you know, I mean, people have actually went out and bought little skunks, they put them on their desk. Uh, we have digital ones because we've got people in all different, mar you know, different uh, virtual teams. But it's great because we learn from it. So Patrick Finn yesterday, when he talked about the, his golf game, has a bad round, but he learns from it. We actually explicitly have the skunk award because we want people to, to raise up their hands, say this is where we messed up, we're gonna learn from it overall. So. I just wanted to share those are you know those things, things of active mentorship, declaring boundaries, finding the right tool, think Goldilocks, and celebrating both the good and the bad are great ways of excuses really of leveraging technology to actually engender that trust. Thank you. Thank you, Kim.
Our, our final panelist is Rear Admiral John Kirby. Admiral Kirby is the Pentagon Press Secretary serving as the Chief Spokesman for the Department of Defense. You've probably seen him or heard him on the nightly news C-SPAN or other prominent news outlets. Admiral Kirby is a graduate from the University of so South Florida and holds master's degrees from Troy State University and the Naval War College. He initially qualified at sea as a surface warfare officer and then transitioned to become a Navy public affairs officer. Admiral Kirby has served with the Blue Angels, the Second Fleet, the Chief of Naval Personnel, U.S. Naval Forces Europe, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He also served as the U.S. Navy's Chief of Information, leading the 2,700 officers, sailors, and civilians of the public affairs community in the Department of the Navy. He has also been the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Media Operations. We're honored to have him. Please join me in welcoming Admiral Kirby. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is this on? Uh, it looks like it's on. I, I, uh, I, too, don't have much of a long history with the Academy. It's a real honor to be here. My congressman nominated me to go here, uh, but regrettably, the admissions board had a less than sanguine view of my academic credentials, and I didn't get in. Um, so University of South Florida, fortunately, they had lower standards. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let me just start by asking, how many of y'all are active in social media, in any form, fashion, whatsoever? That's a lot of hands. Now, of those, how many are on Facebook? Okay. <laughs> All right, good, good. Now, on Facebook, how many of you ha are considering leaving Facebook or were on it and left it? In other words, your ideas on Facebook? Yeah, that's great. Can I ask you, ma'am, what what, what's one of the reasons why you're thinking about changing? <laughs> you wait, you wait too much? If, okay, that's good. Uh, one of the common reasons that I hear is that the, the, the demographics are changing, right? Facebook is, is it's, uh, it, the, the people who use it and get on it are changing a lot. I mean, uh, my daughter got off of it as soon as my wife got on it. <laughs> and <laughs> more and more people that are on Facebook tend to be older, uh, a lot of middle-aged uh, white guys looking for high school girlfriends. You're taking a beat yeah, yeah, and she still won't friend me. <laughs> but I am dogged. Um, the, land, the landscape's changing a lot, and social media is obviously, because everything in social media is accelerated, uh, it's a great example of that, but the communication landscape is radically different now than it was when I started doing public affairs in, in 19... And... Uh, <laughs> Let me just give you quick two, three, three quick elements that are changing. First of all, it's more interactive. I think that's, that goes without saying. Everybody, we, we, the social media is a great example of that, but it's an interactive environment. It's more mobile. Eight out of 10 Americans uh, get most of their news and information on some kind of mobile device. I suspect many of you are the same way. It's also increasingly competitive. In 1983, 90% of the media outlets in this country were owned by 50 companies. Today, it's six. And my guess is over the next five, six years, it's going to be fewer than that. Which means that fewer and fewer people sitting in boardrooms are determining what is news for you. They're the ones setting the agenda. It also means that the people out there gathering the news, reporters, those are the people I deal with every day, are living in a much more competitive environment too. The newsrooms are shrinking all over the country. They're forcing reporters to get outside their comfort zones to not just write, but to edit, to, to, to record video, to, 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 uh, to do television spots. Uh, the whole world of journalism is changing. And, and so when I looked at, um, as I've been watching in the last five or six years, this, these incredible shifts in the communication landscape, I came up with a theory that it kind of explains the new world that we're living in. And actually what I believe is we're living in multiple new worlds because there's, each stakeholder in the communication process has an indiff a different environment. And I think there's four, and I, won't, I, I, know I don't have much time, so I won't go into too much detail here, but there's, there's leaders, there's the public, there's the media, and there's public affairs people like me. We're all stakeholders in this communication environment, and each one of us is in a new world. I'll skip the media for today, because I don't think that's really what we're about, so let me just talk about the other three. Leaders are in what I call a post-interview world. And what I mean by that is that when, when I came up, and many of my colleagues here came up, 
many leaders, line officers, were taught to believe that to communicate was to kind of get up like this. You know, it was kind of like a college lecture. You get up, you give your themes and messages, maybe you do an interview with a reporter, you walk away, it's done. You may take a couple questions, you, you're done. Well, it's not a college lecture anymore. It's like a college keg party now. Everybody's in the same room. Everybody wants to talk. Everybody wants to be heard, and you got to give them a way to do that. And so the, a, a really transformational leader today is going to understand that it's not about delivering information. It's about sharing. It's about conversation. People don't want access to information anymore, or they don't just want access to information. They want access to conversation. And that leads me to the, to the public. They're in what I call a post-audience world. And by that, I, I mean two things. When I started doing public affairs, when we would write a public affairs plan, one of the first steps you do, and probably any good public speaker will do this too, is who's my audience? What do they need to hear? What do they want to hear? How do I parcel them out? And so when we'd write these plans, we'd have, you know, Here's the messages we're going to deliver to the sailors. Here's the messages to the families. Here's the messages to Congress, so on and so on. You can't do that anymore. Thanks to technology, when I say it, it's out there. At 1400 today, when I go back to the Pentagon, I'll do one of my twice weekly press conferences, and every word I utter is international and global the second I utter it, which my wife thinks is hilarious. <laughs> it's, it's just that fast. The second aspect of this post-audience world is that people don't just want to be a passive audience anymore. They want to talk back to you. They want you to listen to what they have to say, which means we've got to find ways to engage with them. Social media is a terrific tool. I'm very active on Twitter. Uh, I, I use it to break news. Um, I use it to respond to, to bad news or to, to stories that I think are inaccurate or are missing context. I use it to talk to just anybody about anything. Uh, you have to be authentic, of course. It has to be you doing it, but you have to provide a vehicle for people to talk back to you. And more importantly, you have to be willing to listen and accept the notion that you might be wrong and that some reader or some viewer uh, out in Muskegee is right and be willing to say that and admit that publicly for the whole world to see. If you're not in the conversation, you're losing it. And that's why I think social media has been very valuable to us, but it, it can't be the only. Thing. You have to also have interpersonal skills. You've got to have good relationships, and I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, and then the media, I'm sorry, the pu uh, pu public affairs officers, guys like me, we're living in what I call a post-clandestine world. And I don't mean that that means we can't ever have classified information or we shouldn't ever be doing covert ops. Of course we are. But what I mean by that is um, usually because the information environment is so dynamic and because anybody with a cell phone is in fact, or could be, a reporter. Public affairs professionals like me have to be at the table when decisions are getting made, not afterward. I worked for Admiral Mullen for 11 years. I was his spokesman right up until the time he retired. And there, wasn't, there was hardly ever a meeting uh, that he wouldn't want me in the room for. Uh, there were a couple of obviously very, very classified stuff I wasn't uh, cleared for. or He didn't want me in there when he was deciding what generals and admirals were going to go to their next jobs. But, but and other, than, other than that, he expected me to be in the room because he wanted me to hear him think out loud what he was going to decide or what advice he was going to give the president before he actually decided it or before he actually gave it so that I knew what his, wh wh where his head was. He also expected me to push back on his ideas, whether they had anything to do with the communication environment or not. He knew that as soon as he made a decision, very soon after, it was probably going to be public because you have to brief the Hill, you're going to go to the White House, people talk, things leak in Washington. I know that's a shock, but they do. And so he wanted me to be informed. He also wanted me to have the opportunity to tell him when I thought he was, what he was wrong, which made him, just in my mind, just an, an exceptional uh, leader. But too often I see, and I'm, I know I'm looking at a lot of future line officers out there, I'm begging you, when you get to the point where you have public affairs on your staff, keep that person close. Make sure they know what you're thinking, and make sure you give them a chance to influence your decisions before you, you make them. In the 11 years I worked for the Admiral, I don't think there were probably three or four times when a reporter would ask me, what does Mullen think about X, Y, or Z, where I had to go to him and ask him, because I knew, and I was able to talk right there for him. It, it gave me a huge advantage, and it made me faster. This gets back to this technology that we're dealing with and how fast information moves. We can never afford to be wrong uh, but we can't surrender speed just for want of information. So the fact that I knew what he was thinking uh, made me a lot better at communicating uh, what exactly we were trying to do. May 1st, 2011. 
I was on the couch, and I was sucking on a couple of bottles of beer, and I was watching the Mets play the Phillies, and the phone rang. And it was a guy named Ben Rhodes from the, well, the, from the White House. He is uh, now the Deputy National Security Advisor under Susan Rice. Then he was the Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategic Communications. He was basically the head PAO there at the National Security Council. And he said, hey, John, can you get to the White House today? That's a Sunday. And there's only one answer when you get that question. I mean, what, what was I going to say? No, I'm watching the Mets and the Phillies. And so I went. I said, um, but then I said, oh, yeah, sure, I can get there. Uh, uh, what's it about? And he goes, I can't tell you, but you're going to want to be here. I said, okay. Do I need to be in uniform? He goes, well, your boss has been here all day, and he's in uniform, so yeah, it'd probably be a good idea if you go in uniform. That was also a stupid question. You're not going to go to the White House as an active duty officer in flip-flops and shorts with potato chip grease all over them. So yeah, I put my uniform on. So I get to the White House, and I go into the Situation Room, and uh, they could see I was a Naval officer. They said, you must be here to see Admiral Mullen. I said, yes. They said, he's over there in this little glass booth. He was in a tiny little glass office uh, just off to the uh, side of the conference room where the president holds his meetings down there. Uh, I knocked on the door, went in. He goes, hey, Kirby, do you know why you're here? I said, I haven't got a clue. And he said, well, we got bin Laden. And I said, well, by God, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, we killed him. And then he got this little smile on his face. He was pretty happy at that moment. And he had the phone in his ear. And I said, sir, who are you calling? He goes, I'm just trying to call Pakistan. I think they should know. Um, <laughs> I said, yes, sir, that's a good idea. <laughs> Might want to give him a ring. Um, uh, so I stayed there with him at the White House. I got there probably about 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and, and I didn't get out of there until 1 in the morning. Um, a lot happened in those intervening hours. Obviously, we believed that we had killed uh, bin Laden, but we weren't 100% sure, and we were waiting for, for uh, more final evidence that it was, in fact, him, uh, because the president was sure as heck not going to go out and talk to the American people that night unless we knew that we had, had our man. But there was an awful lot of, of discussion and decisions that had to be made in those intervening hours. And uh, in, in, the, in the main conference room, the bigger of the two were the principals, all the cabinet officers, including Admiral Mullen, Secretary Gates was there, Secretary Clinton, CIA Director Panetta, everybody was there, and they were advising the president on what the next steps ought to be. Uh, in the smaller conference room were all us communicators, all of us PAOs and spokesmen from all the different agencies. Many of us had never met before, and none of us were read into this mission, none of us, except one, the CIA's. Uh, public affairs officer had been read in. And luckily, one of us had been, was living in this post-clandestine world because he came to that meeting with a public affairs plan, at least a, a shell of one. Now, it had various branches and sequels because we didn't know if we were actually going to be successful in killing bin Laden. So we had, a, we had a plan for if we didn't get him, we had a plan for if we wounded him, and certainly we had a plan for if we killed him. Uh, and I would say that in the big conference room where all the cabinet officers were, the food was a lot better. They had they had much fancier food, and where they kept us communicators, it was Dorito chips and Cokes. Um, but we worked all together for, for about six to eight hours, kind of figuring out what we knew, what the president could say we knew, and then how would we communicate it. In that one night, I saw all three of those worlds come together. The, the principals all understood that they lived in a post-interview world, that they had to communicate and explain this to the American people in simple, clear terms, and that they had to give the American people a chance to ask questions and talk back to them. Uh, the public affairs officers like me, we definitely uh, knew that we were in a post-clandestine world because this was going to be news and it was going to break quickly. We were trying to get ahead of it. Uh, I don't know if you remember that night, but boy, everybody, everybody knew there was a meeting at the White House and everybody was abuzz about it. Uh, and, every, and we were all afraid it was going to leak out of Pakistan. The sun was coming up in Pakistan as we deliberated, and there was a burning helicopter in a compound in Abbottabad, and we needed to get ahead of that. Uh, so it was important for us uh, to do that. And of course, we knew that the American people were going to be keenly interested in this story. It was the biggest story in, in a decade, and they were definitely going to want to say. So we put together a plan. The president did go out, and then after he got out uh, and did his speech, we held a backgrounder with reporters. We took principals, not spokesmen, but actual decision makers, and put them on the phone on background as US officials or defense officials to explain to the degree that we could what happened and why and where everybody was, particularly because this helicopter was burning. We had to explain for that, too. 
So it was a perfect illustration of those three worlds uh, coming together. The, the point I'm trying to make is that, that uh, we are, we're living in an increasingly dynamic information environment that requires us all to be flexible. And uh, the other thing it requires, and other speakers hit on this, is the empower of relationships. One of the biggest factors that night was that Admiral Mullen knew General Kiani, the chief of staff of the Pakistan Army, who was arguably the most powerful man in Pakistan at the time. We had made 26 trips to Pakistan. It wasn't enough for Mullen to pick up the phone and call Kiani, which he did a lot. He insisted on going face to face, and we talked a lot with, with General Kiani. We toured Pakistan with him. He toured some installations in the United States with us. There was trust there. And when Admiral Mullen got a hold of General Kiani that night and told him what we had done, it was a tense phone call, no question about it. Um, I got to be in the room when he made that phone call. But it was also one of mutual appreciation. Kiani knew that we had to do what we had to do, and Mullen knew that Kiani was going to be in a difficult position the next day uh, because he had to explain to the Pakistani people how and why the Americans were able to pull something like this off. But because the two of them trusted one another and had a good relationship, a relationship that was fostered face-to-face -face, but also through electronic means, uh, we were able to get through it. And it was, it was something General Kiani said that night that I think made a huge impact on the president and other senior leaders. And he said, the sun is coming up, and I have to explain to the Pakistani people what's just happened. So the more you can explain in America before I have to explain it when the sun comes up, the better I'll be and the better this relationship will be. And we weathered that relationship. It, it made it tense, no question about it. Uh, the relationship with Pakistan got more tense after that. But we weathered it because we invested so heavily in that relationship, and we didn't just rely on technology to do it. That's it for me. Thanks. Thank you. So 1,400. You can have your little phones there looking at the Admiral. Tweet him when you don't like something he's saying at the podium there at, at the Pentagon, and you can actually uh, be right on. I no kidding. Every time I get off the podium, I get an email from my mom. Uh, I'm not kidding. Every single time. And, uh, and she is brutal on me. I mean, absolutely as, vicious. So there's nothing she, you can tell me that's going to upset me. As she should be, sir. So we're going we're gonna to open it up for, for questions now because we have a large panel. The kind of question answer time is a little condensed here. I'm going to ask you not to have a multi-part question. Uh, <laughs> just have a single question, but you can come up to the microphones. If you want to direct the question to a particular panelist, that's great. Or just open it as a whole, and we'll try to move fairly quickly. And I'm going to ask the panelists to give fairly brief answers as well so we can get a couple of people talking. Ma'am, please. Hi, uh, my name is Cabrini Pack. I teach management information systems at Catholic University of America. Um, thank you so much for your generosity and sharing your time and talent with us. Um, one of the things that we do uh, at Catholic University is in addition to teaching things like database design, systems, um, information technology, neural networks, etc., cetera, um, we try to instill in our students a deeper understanding of human dignity, solidarity, subsidiarity, the common good. So things that are true to our own identity as uh, Catholic Christians. Um, when I was corporate, one of the things I noticed was a polarization in the discussion of the types of leadership models that corporations should follow, particularly between authentic leadership and servant leadership. And it changed the way, as you got closer to the C-suite, it changed the way the relationships were developed throughout the corporation, throughout the company. My hunch is that servant leadership and authentic leadership can be incorporated and integrated in a better way as to reduce the polarization of those who champion something along the lines of authentic leadership and a behavioral paradigm there, or servant leadership, which implies a different behavioral paradigm. So um, for Dr. McClellan and any of you on the panel, um, what are your thoughts on that and have you experienced that polarity and what would you recommend in terms of how we pass this on to our students to integrate those models rather than create a polarization or a dialectic in the marketplace? Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Um, that's a very good question. The, the integration of authentic leadership and servant leadership, authentic leadership with its, its tendency to say you need to be yourself, right? You need to be who you are and authentically you, and, and servant leadership saying, but your core motivation needs to be to care about and to serve those that you are leading, and indeed all of the individuals, and the organization itself, and the, the paradoxical balance that comes with that. 
Uh, it, it creates an interesting challenge. But I think one of the important things to remember is that at the core of servant leadership is the concept of empathy and the capacity to recognize the humanity in others, to recognize their emotional nature, to recognize who they are. And empathy is an innate human characteristic. All of us possess empathy. Uh, if you don't possess empathy, you're probably not here. You're probably in a prison cell somewhere. Um, and so there is this innate capacity to recognize the humanity in others. And I think if we start with that concept of empathy and we build on that concept of empathy, recognizing and respecting the humanity in other individuals, it helps us to, to come in touch with that core that helps us to be servant leadership practitioners, but at the same time helps us to be authentic in that, that practice of servant leadership. So that would be my response. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and roll to that microphone. All right, good morning, gentlemen. My name is uh, Michigan First Class, Emily Moore from Penn State University. And my question to you all is, when you're working with a global team and you're having these video conferences, multiple email chains, how do you keep those teams on track while they'll ha they're having their global influences, cultural influences, and how do you empower them to be successful at you know, completing their goals while contributing to the overall goal of uh, you know your company or the mission set that's there. So I can I, I can kind of start and then other folks can weigh in. Um, so I think I think it starts with um, the way that I think about this is um, it really starts with making sure you've got one common culture that that your entire team is built around, um, but also making sure that the unique cultural characteristics and capabilities of those respective cultures are also reflected in who they are. So I like to say when. I visit our office in London. I want it to feel like Pinterest, but I also want it to feel unique to that market. Uh, because I think there's a pride that comes in that um, that can be really complementary to the overall culture. Uh, I, I think it's also really important that your global teams feel really empowered. I think one of the challenges you can face when you're a remote team that is uh, distributed from headquarters is you can feel like you don't necessarily have decision-making power. It's hard, you know, Tom touched on this, dialing into a global call where 90% of the folks who are on it um, are in San Francisco and you have a team of three or four sitting in London trying to weigh in can be really, really challenging. And um, it, it's really, really critical that those respective teams feel like they have real ownership and autonomy. And so I think there are things that you can do as a leader to make sure that they've got really explicit decision-making authority, um, that the, the lines and boundaries are really crystal clear on the decisions that they're empowered to make as a local team as it reflects their success in that particular local market. Finally, I think there's some really simple but really important things that you can do to make sure that their voice is heard in those discussions. So if you're on a video conference and you have teams dialing in from other locations, if you're leading that, pausing and explicitly asking those teams, hey, London, do you guys have thoughts on this particular topic? If you don't do that, odds are they probably won't contribute. So I think there's small tactical things like that that can make a really big difference. Um, <clears throat> I'll add one uh, other comment because I think Don, uh, Don was spot on with a lot of the ways I think about it. Um, getting out and being uh, uh, local with those teams, learning what those cultural differences are, learning what they're, or working with them on what their goals and objectives are, uh, I think gives you a lot better idea about how they contribute and making sure that they're, they're engaged. Um, on the engagement, it's interesting because, um, you know, we have a pretty extroverted culture at Facebook. I think we reward extroverts, and uh, the whole universe is not extroverts, right? There are a lot of introverts out there, and uh, there's a book, Quiet, uh, that I read that was really interesting, and it got me thinking very uh, uh, hard about how, in meetings and things, do you encourage the introverts to participate as well? Uh, and, you know, they have very valuable things to say. In many cases, you have to kind of coax it out of them. And I would say, you know, you have that same introvert, extrovert. You have a, the United States is an extroverted culture when you compare it to a lot of other places. And, and so you have to kind of help draw that out. And, and there are uh, activities that you have to be as the leader in the meeting to make sure that those folks are engaged. Great, thank you. Great, please. Good morning, gentlemen. Midshipman First Class, Tyler Toppenberg, Texas a and University. One of the things we discussed yesterday in our discussion groups um, was the use of Facebook as a tool to get to know your subordinates, um, especially in the military. Make sure that uh, troop morale is high and stuff. Uh, Mr. Fall, you spoke about um, your face-to-face -face interaction with your men 
and getting to know them and um, your squad leader, finding out about your squad leader overseas. My question for the board is, um, wh what is your opinion on using social media as a tool to get to know your guys and check on troop morale and make sure they're doing things, um, I guess, in their personal lives. They're, per they're taking care of themselves in their personal lives versus face-to-face. I guess they should be checking Pinterest, then Facebook, and checking on their phone. Odds are your guys are probably not on Pinterest. Um, <laughs> we're working on that, though. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, having worked at Facebook, um, I, uh, I was, Facebook wasn't around when I was on active duty. And in some respects, I'm glad, because it would have made my job a lot harder, I think, um, in some respects. Uh, and in other ways, I think it's a really powerful tool. It's a tricky one, to be honest with you. I think the first thing to remember is, um, the relationship between you and your men and women, you're not friends. That's not where it starts. Like, um, and I think there is, um, there is some risk in, in using some of these social platforms that blur the line between personal and professional. If you're not really, really thoughtful and careful, um, it can interrupt what is a absolutely critical relationship that you're building with your people. And so, you know, I won't tell you you should or you shouldn't be friends with the, you know, your, your soldiers, your Marines, et cetera. But if you're gonna do it, be really thoughtful. Uh, I would also just add, if you do it, you're gonna see things you don't want to. And when you see those things, you're gonna have to act on them. Um, I think there were things that I was blissfully unaware that my Marines were doing on the weekends that would have fundamentally changed. And so, um, if you're, I think Facebook and these other social platforms can be a really powerful tool to communicate but they can also really blur the lines uh, and, and kind of disrupt what is a really critical professional relationship that you need to build with your people. Comments from the other end, non-Facebook people? The only thing, only thing I would add to it is, um, I, I would echo that as a leader, I would, I would really think about that if I'm gonna friend them on Facebook, but for, to your point of morale, having your team, if they're on Facebook anyway, to make sure that they are actually together on that, um, goes back to the Commandant's uh, statements earlier of be excellent to each other, and it's a good way for the, your, the team to monitor themselves. Um, so if there is something going on that for whatever reason doesn't come up in another way, they can help each other out. And it's some self-monitoring as, as a team as well, not putting, you know, not putting, escalating it to the leaders. I would just add, that if you're gonna, the, the risks notwithstanding, and I agree with them, uh, if you're gonna use it as a tool, just be mindful that it is a tool, not the tool, and that a good leader still needs to know your people authentically, face to face. You have to invest in them, and you can't do that through social media. But I agree, it's, a, it's an environment you need to be careful on. The other thing I would say is, while I'm on this, is for those of us in uniform using social media, we need to be mindful, aside from uh, unit morale and, and communications with your leaders. We need to be mindful of what we're putting on there. Now, I'm not saying, you know, we're also U.S. citizens and have the right of free speech, but when you wear this uniform, it stands for something a little bit different, and we need to be careful. I got off of Facebook, quite frankly, because the blurring of the line for me personally and professionally was getting uncomfortable. And I was seeing things that some junior PAOs were putting on there, political views, religious views, that I don't, it's not, not for me to judge, but as a spokesman for the military, um, I think public affairs officers uh, need to restrict their right of free speech just a little bit voluntarily. Uh, so I, I got off of it um, because it was making me uncomfortable and, uh, and I was hoping that maybe that might set an example for others. You just have to be very careful out there. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. Good morning, Eric Dominguez from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, my question is open to the panel. We see in companies a leadership climate and culture throughout its senior management and, and small project teams. And I found a small Spanish, a large Spanish company in the Basque region called Mondragon, which employs democratic philosophies where essentially <laughs> it treats its leaders and managers as we would treat our congressmen and senators as civil servants. So do you believe in the future we could employ these democratic philosophies throughout our companies to better manage, to better manage them? I mean, I'll, I'll take a little bit of that. Um, I think, uh, so uh, Facebook's all about open communication, uh, both internally as a corporate culture uh, and the platform itself. I think to some extent it democratizes the discussion, um, but I'm also one to believe that at a certain point um, decisions need to be made. Uh, and one of the things I found, um, uh, you know, a few years ago, 
I would have this, this one guy always called me into a meeting at a certain point, and he's like, I need you in this meeting. I'm like, what's it about? And he'd give me a little brief on it. And I would go in, and it was a bunch of the teams were trying to focus on some activity. And they needed a little bit of a nudge. Like, okay, this sounds good, but in reality, you need to go first, and you need to go second, and we need some help to do the third thing. And, and uh, sometimes it takes like somebody at the top to actually give that kind of a nudge. So that would be my. I, I guess, you know, building on Tom's point, um, it took me, when I first got to my first tech company, I worked at Google first, and Google, and I think this is probably representative of a lot of consumer technology companies, is a very consensus-based model where there is an expectation from every person you work with that they will have a voice that will be part of every decision. Uh, coming out of Marine Infantry, this was a little bit of a culture <laughs> shock for me. Uh, and so I, it took me a little time to adjust. And, and I think there is a balance somewhere between, I think, where, where we started at Google and, and I think what we did in the Marine Corps that, that can make for the best model. What I love about the consensus model is, look, as a leader, particularly as a new leader, when you join your first unit, you're gonna be the person who knows the least about what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and you're fortunate in having a bunch of men and women who have been there, done that. Particularly in this day and age, when you get to the fleet, you will probably have a lot of combat veterans who have been overseas doing the job, and you haven't. And in that, you know, there is an enormous amount of information and wisdom and context that it's your job to solicit from your team. And I think in a hierarchical organization, sometimes the hierarchy can get in the way in that. So it's your job to ask those questions to get that context and information on the table. Uh, but at the end of the day, you, know, you gotta make a call and you gotta move forward. And at, at Pinterest, at Facebook, at, at Google, we could go round and round for days of trying to get to consensus. And as a leader, your job is to get the information on the table and then facilitate the decision so you can move quickly. So I think finding that balance is, for me, the sweet spot. The only thing I'd add to it is, same thing, into it, very, um, uh, it's on a journey from moving from just the consensus piece to it to how do you get commitment. So I, to the, the philosophies of let's have the context, let's have the dialogue, but to, again to the end of the day to say this is the decision and then let's make sure everyone is committed to it, whether you agree or not, because we're all in it together. But having that dialogue of the commitment um, can at least help bridge that gap. Great. Before we take the next question, I'm just going to mention, in case you're one of those people who really looks at the clock really closely in your booklet and it says we're supposed to end at 1010. We're going to extend this panel just a little bit so we can get a couple more questions in because we have such engaging individuals that are up here to uh, answer those questions. But I'm still going to ask you to keep your questions concise so we can get to everybody who's up. Yes, sir. Good morning. Dr. Oviedo Gambetta, Peruvian Navy, Headmaster of Division of Morals and Ethics at the Peruvian Naval Academy. This is my second day here and my third time in Annapolis. Mr. Furlan, he mentioned about that personal relationships is something that cannot be substituted. And then I was surprised, and very well surprised, by Mr. McLechlin, when he mentioned that we have to trust people. But my question is this very concrete. Communicate and give information. But I'm concerned about something of the communicators is the person, the human person. I go to linguistics. In Greek, you say person, hypostasin. That means in Greek, the one who's under his own being. And the actor that goes in the stage and he wears a mask, in Greek, you say hypocrites, hypocritical, under the mask. So, communication is something personal. So, is the same thing to give communication and data and information in spite of empowering the personal relationship. In Italian we say, face to face, we say parlare a quattro occhi, to speak to four eyes, face to face. My question is, if we are so concerned in the dynamics of communication, in the data, of course now, when the Apollo in 1969 went to the moon, what sort of computer there was, 286, it's as big as a fridge. Now I have 128 gigabytes here. No, it's quite different. But the risk is that we can be concerned about dynamics of communicating, but what's gonna happen with the human beings as individuals, individuals is that not can be divided. Individual comes from an individual, he cannot be divided. 
my concern for the human person as a being, as a single being, that he has to have relationship with other people. If we just go through our machines, perhaps we can lose our own personality. What can we do for that? Thank you. Look for the panel as a whole. Okay, great. I'll t uh, take the first stab at that one. I, th I agree. You can, uh, if you're just so technology focused and you use that as an excuse not to have the dialogues, not to have the discussions, not to understand people and have empathy overall, it's a disservice to the relationship that you have to your, your core um, uh, engagement, uh, and you're not going to most likely accomplish the mission at hand. So, uh, again, the technology is, a, a, from my perspective, is a great excuse to continue the dialogue to actually increase human interaction, whether it's using the technology or the decisions of how do we use it um, moving forward. Um, but again, that can engender it versus uh, uh, don't use, I would never use it as an excuse to say, oh, this is just a transaction or excuse not to talk to someone. Anybody else on the panel of uh, technology losing the human touch? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I want to tell a little bit of a story that I heard. Uh, and it was, um, it, it was about Facebook and it was, uh, the kind of comment was, you know, having these kind of electronic connections, don't you just uh, kind of lose the personal touch? You know, your, your conversations are less rich in a way. Uh, and and the, the comment on it was actually the conversations you have when you're in person can be more rich. So if you went off and went skiing last weekend and I see you at the office, instead of saying, hey, what'd you do last weekend? You know, and you have this back and forth, back and forth, kill off a few minutes, you can say, wow, I saw you went up skiing. Looked awesome. You know, how was it? Oh, you went with your kids. I mean, in a way, it can help enhance that conversation as well. You kind of get rid of some extraneous uh, when you do have the opportunity, but you have to get back to the face-to-face, -face, I think, is, is the basic premise. I think it's important to remember that uh, I agree with everything that's been said, and I'm obviously a big proponent of face-to-face -face personal relationships, but don't forget the power of technology to connect us all as a global neighborhood. Let me give you a quick example. A few years ago, uh, Tahrir Square in Cairo renewed protests, political protests. Uh, you might remember there were some news stories that some young men, thugs, were, were illegitimate protesters, were going to Tahrir Square using fairly sophisticated hand signals between one another silently to identify young women taking them off Tahrir Square and then uh, assaulting them el elsewhere uh, in, in the neighborhoods of uh, Cairo. What started to happen was legitimate protesters, people that were there for political purposes, were watching this happen. They grabbed their smartphones and they started putting it out on Twitter. Hey, I just saw whatever. I saw five guys. One of them was wearing a black hood. They got this woman. They're taking her to a corner of you know, this place and this place. The police started to read those Twitter feeds and started to then show up at that corner and disrupt the crime sometimes before it could be completed, and so was the media. And eventually, that crime stopped, and the protests went on without it. And that's a, to me, that's an example of how humanity can use technology to help one another. Now, they didn't know these young women. It didn't matter that they didn't know them. But they used social media as a way to connect to one, to one another, to law enforcement, to the media, to stop a, an egregious crime. So there's, a, there's, a, there's humanity in it, too, if it's used for that purpose. Thank you so much. I, I wanted to comment on this one as well, because when, when we think about this concept of empathy, it's important from a neuropsychological standpoint to understand that there are basically two empathic processes. One of them is face-to-face -face dependent. As we engage with others in face-to-face in -face interaction, um, we experience a process of emotional contagion through facial recognition, mirror neurons, other things like that. We, we pick up on the emotion of others and experience to some extent what they're experiencing. And that sharing of emotion is, is critical to trust formation. And so that aspect is really hard to do without when it comes to relationship formation. But the second one is an imaginative process. It's the capacity to put ourselves in, through our imagination into the position of the other, right? It's this I-thou that Martin Buber talks about. And so the key is, how do we engage via electronic media without disengaging our empathy? When we can't have that face-to-face -face emotional contagion, we have to keep that imaginative empathetic process active, realizing there's another person on the other end and how are they feeling, how are they responding. And, and that's, that's a challenge because it's easy to disengage that without that face-to-face -face interaction. Precisely, Mr. Cleland, in English we have, it is not my mother tongue, but you can say reliable, reliability, 
safety, and security. Human beings, we have to be reliable one with the other. And not only be because of the screen, mm -hmm. but reliability comes from a personal touch. Mm -hmm. And can you trust? That's the most important thing, I've, what you mentioned, about trusting other people. If you just distrust, is when you start try, uh, first going a bicycle, I'm going to fall down, I'm going to fall down, and you fall down. When you forget that you're going to fall down, you will not fall down. So reliable people is not only with the technology. Of course, it is important. We cannot live with these things out now. But reliability comes from that personal touch and the insights that each one has. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Midshipman Second Class Ash, Wrestler Polytechnic Institute. Um, my, my question is related to the medium of technology. You know, we spoke a lot about um, the trust between two people. And I was just wondering, as we move towards a more online presence, um, how do you establish trust in that medium? And this is more towards uh, Mr. Donfall and uh, Thomas Furlong. All right, there you go. So, I, you know, I think, I think it starts face to face. Uh, I think I think the you know the foundation of of any strong relationship is sitting down with someone and getting to know them. And I think if you when you build that foundation, I think these online platforms can be a really really powerful complement to that. Um, and so, you know, Tom touched on this a bit. Like I you know we have teams all over the world. That's why I travel. I travel and I spend time with them. I get to know them in person. I sit down with them. Um, I have a conversation uh, you know, with them about who they are, where they're from, what they love doing, how work's going. That gives me the opportunity then to, to continue that relationship on email or on Facebook. And, and I suspect in some respects um, that will continue to be the case. Um, I think there are ways of, there are certain technology platforms that make it a little easier. I think video conference is a huge game changer. It just fundamentally, being able to see who you're talking with doing one-on-ones through a Google Hangout now, through, through products that are pretty close to free, um, can be really powerful. But I, you know, I, would, uh, I would suspect that it, it will never be a complete, uh, an absolute substitute for, for that in-person relationship that you build. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Um, remote employees that we have, uh, whenever we hire them, we always bring them back to Menlo Park and have them spend a fair amount of time when they uh, first come into Facebook in Menlo, meeting the different people who are there. Uh, you know, there's a lot of orientation and other things. I think that helps build that initial connection. Uh, and then myself and the leadership team, we're out in the field. And uh, we're out on a constant, repetitive cadence. And so I think they see us a lot. And, and you know, kind of going back to my story, it's like I want people to be comfortable coming and telling us things, uh, you know, bringing up issues, uh, uh, giving us ideas. You know, we, we don't have the monopoly on the best ideas uh, you know, at the kind of corporate hub of the company. And to run a high availability operation, we need the field teams to be actually contributing because actually that's where all of the, the real, you know, kind of rubber meets the road is for us in terms of the, the at least the physical technology. Can I Thank comment you. to that one too? Real That'd quick, right. please. One of the things that I want to mention with this is it, it's critical to remember that you have that online presence, that online brand. Um, you send me an email, say, Jeff, I'd like you to do something. I'm going to Google you. I am. And I, I'm going to see what it says about you. Do I see in your online presence competence, character, benevolence? When I look out there, do I see things that imply trust to me? And uh, do I want that interaction? So I, I think we need that face-to-face, -face, but we need to make sure that what we're putting out there in a technological environment is consistent with relationship formation and relationship building and not detrimental to that. Thank you, gentlemen. We're, we're going to take two more questions. I know this young man just got up to do it, but we're going to, we're going to end with the, no, you're, you're okay. You're okay. My we're going to come over here, the though. Same, so I'm not going to ask it. So. What's that? My question was pretty much the same. Oh, as see, there you go. Okay, so you still got your question. So if you could be concise, and we'll ask for concise answers, too, and we'll get the last two questions in. Go ahead, please. My name is Cadet Gay from West Point, uh, uh, Rear Admiral Kirby. This question is for you. Um, how would you describe the information sharing approach by our government? Would you say it's focused more on strictly sharing information and letting uh, the civilians or the media create an understanding, or would you say that you try to create contextual understanding for us? Thank you. Uh, well, I'll tell you what we try to do is, is context. 
Um, when I go to the podium, um, I'm responsible for two things. One is to provide facts, figures, information, because that's what the Pentagon Press Corps likes. But my main obligation is to be on that room to the American people to explain things so that it's understandable. And uh, so I think, uh, I think we're doing better at it. I think we got a long way to go. Um, I'm, uh, I wish we had a little bit better uh, provision of access to independent reporting for what's going on in Iraq right now. It's difficult. We can't embed reporters the way we used to. But I think fundamentally, and this is what I tell every young PAO, our job is context. It's the most important word in our lexicon. That, that, it's not just what we're doing, it's explaining why and how we're doing it. And you have to put that in terms that people can understand. That's where the, that's where the emphasis has to be. And what we try to do, and again, I don't think we're perfect at it, what we try to do in all our platforms, whether it's online or whether it's me at the podium today, is to try to offer that and uh, to try to simplify, condense, and make things understandable. Thank you. Last question. Good morning, gentlemen. Midshipman Thorpe from Villanova University. Um, Thinking back to when Osama bin Laden was killed, I was actually studying abroad, and um, it's not that I wasn't ecstatic for the news, but I don't think I was as ecstatic as most Americans were because I was in a different culture and in a different environment. I was wondering if you could talk about the role you think culture and environment ha has on the way that you interpret information. Hmm. Oof. Yeah. Sure, I'll give it. Um, I'll start off. So our teams are um, obviously in, in the States, in the UK, and in India. Um, so when we're um, delivering messages, uh, we've through the hard knocks, we found out that, that there's miscommunication um, or misinterpretation of what's going on. So what we've um, so we've acknowledged that. Uh, what we've done to again is more face-to-face -face communications whenever we're possible. I've, actually go to London tomorrow and then India after that um, so that we can actually have working sessions and try to share context if we're changing strategy, if we're evolving, um, you know, what our priorities are overall so it can be face-to-face -face so that we can hear the context, we can see the, 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 the eye movements in the room, uh, we can get the body gestures, um, and we can pull it out because the cult, we, have done, we've, uh, we acknowledge that the culture is different. In India, most of our team are those introverts. Um, and brilliant, brilliant folks, but um, they're not the first ones that are going to put their hands up and say, you know, ask, ask the question. They will immediately afterwards. So we try to encourage it in the meeting. We also, uh, if need be, we make sure that we're, there's an open dialogue afterwards, whether we're physically there or but online. But you're, you're um, right on as far as there are differences, just as there are differences in schools uh, of each of the cultures that are here today. Um, and starting with understanding the other person first and seeing Seeing that person through their eyes uh, and being inquisitive and having that empathy is, 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 the, is the best first start. I think words matter a lot, too. I mean, um, one of the things we've gotten really good at 13 years of war is, is understanding the cultures uh, of the places in which we've been operating. doesn't mean we always agree on everything, but at least we've made the effort and we've tried. Look at Operation Inherent, Inherent Resolve, this fight against ISIL. I mean, the name got kind of a, a lot of jibes from the Pentagon press corps. As, you know, it's not very aggressive and muscular. But we, General Austin, made an effort to choose a name for that operation that meant something in Arabic and meant something to the coalition partners in the region. And I don't know the Arabic language, but I'm told that it, it translates well and it has a meaning there that maybe we don't fully appreciate here. Now you might see some leaders are referring to ISIL as Daesh. It's really an Arabic acronym for ISIL but it also carries another subtext meaning in the language that is derisive to that group. And many of our coalition partners, our Arab partners in this effort, uh, strongly urge us to stop referring to these guys as Islamic State or ISIL or ISIS because it, their belief is it gives them a credibility uh, uh, that, that they don't deserve, a legitimacy they don't deserve. So you'll see us starting to use that phrase a little bit more. Uh, Secretary Kerry's used it, General Allen's used it, and uh, General Austin is starting to use it. Um, so you do need to, words matter, and what, what they mean where you are matters a lot. Just to comment on that one as well. The, uh, I think what cultural experiences do for us is they expand our capacity capacity to experience the world in different ways through a different mindset. And so, just as an example, in Latin America, if you say, I'm an American, uh, Latin Americans will say, well, so are we. 
right? And they, 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 they don't like that use of the term American to just refer to us. And so I've gotten in the habit of saying Estadounidense when I'm in Latin America. And it, then it sounds funny when I try to say I'm a United Statesian in the U.S. because it doesn't sound quite right. But you get this capacity to see things through different mindsets, through different worldviews. And it, it fundamentally changes the way you see the world. Um, because you can now say, okay, from my American perspective, what does that look like? From my Latin American perspective that I have, which may be a simplified version, how do I see that? And so I think it gives us a more complex way of looking at the world that, that changes the way we see things, and hence the importance of intercultural experiences like studying abroad. Can I do it for you? Yes, sir. Okay. So w we've had a very engaging panel here. I, I want to... I want to highlight a couple of things that have been said here for us to think about. One is, is there's definitely a staggering rate of change in technology that's not going to stop. So we, we, we as leaders have a responsibility to keep up with what's going on. That's going to be important for us. A second thing that was mentioned a number of times is that technology complements the personal relationships. It doesn't take the place and it can't dominate. And I think we have to keep remembering that, that sitting behind our computer or just staying on our phones and not enough for leadership. There is this face-to-face -face that's very important. We have to be aware of micromanagement because we have a lot of information. We can reach out to everybody in every little corner. That doesn't mean we should as leaders. Another thing that was mentioned that I think is very interesting is we as young people, well, you as young people, you all get to mentor upward. You get to be courageous followers in helping those more senior, older leaders figure what's going on and give them good advice. Don't hesitate to, to do that. And the other thing is, is that we have to give people the ability to share, converse, talk, which means we have to be very, very good listeners. And I think we have to keep developing that skill. I want to end with one final thought for us as we, as we go out. I happen to work at the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership. It's named after Admiral Jim Stockdale. He was a prisoner of war in Vietnam for seven and a half years. Four and a half of those seven and a half were in solitary confinement. Two and a half of those seven and a half were in leg irons, where he was restricted in his movement and an incredible amount of pain. I got to know the man over the years. I consider him a, a role model, a mentor, and a friend. But I remember him talking about communication, which is really what we're talking about here, whether it's technology, face-to-face, -face, or a campfire. And I think he would say that the social media site for them in that prisoner of war camp were the walls that were in between the cells. That, that was their ability to communicate. The technology they used was a tap code. They developed a five-by-five five matrix, 26 letters in the alphabet, they dropped K, made it a five-by-five five matrix, and they used TAP to communicate. That was, the, that was the technology. They had a common vision. Vision's been mentioned a couple of times this morning. That common vision was return with honor. Not just return, but return with honor as a group, as prisoners of war. But I remember something that Admiral Stockdale said. It had nothing to do with the TAP code. What it had to do with who was behind those walls, that they were counting on that those people that were on the other side of the wall were people of integrity, people of character, people who had courage and confidence and faith and compassion. And ultimately, in my personal view, whether we're around the campfire or whether we're tapping at a keyboard, it's not the technology, it's not the sight, What's the key is, is the leader behind that keyboard, behind that campfire, and that person's trustworthiness, their compassion, their faith, their courage, all those things that are important, that's what's going to make the difference. So it does come back to the individual. And as leaders, we have that responsibility where we're at the campfire, or we're behind the keyboard, or we're traveling all over the world like these guys to reach out what we're made of, our heart, mind, and soul, that's what really matters when we start thinking about how do we communicate with each other. I'd like to thank this incredible panel that does amazing work around the world, influences all kinds of people, and I'd like all of us to give them one more hand for what they've done for us today.
And thank you for all of uh, you for being here and the great questions you asked. And I'm not sure what's next, Chris, but whatever you want to tell them. Yes, sir. Wow. I think we can all agree that that was, uh, that was amazing. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your insightful remarks. Um, I'd like to now present you all a token um, of our appreciation on behalf of the 2015 Naval Academy Leadership Conference.